Thank you so much for coming today. Um, welcome to our first program of Summer Reading Club. If you haven't signed up for Summer Reading Club, you can drop by the information desk under the question mark anytime. It doesn't cost a thing, you just need your library card and you'll be entered to win a whole bunch of different prizes um, and our grand prizes are uh, Kindle Voyage e-readers. So um, anytime you read a book or attend a program, you, get, you can earn credit for um, an entry into the prize drawing. So I'm going to send around for those of you who have or will sign up for summer reading, just put down your name and your library card number and uh, we'll get you entered in our prize drawings. So today I'm excited to have uh, Joanne and Rebecca Moore who are going to tell us all about the surprising fashions of Civil War era women. I've been asked more than once every time I do this program, well what's so unusual? What's so not ordinary? Well, first of all, as I've talked to people and, and uh, studied history, I particularly enjoy uh, women's history 1840 through the Civil War. And most of my life I've lived on the prairies. And so that's where my biggest bulk of knowledge comes from. But now that we're here, I've been working with uh, listening to people at the Civil War Roundtable at uh, Dr. Nichols over at the university, a lot of people have been very helpful in sharing more of history of this area. And that's what I, if any of you have books or diaries or anything to do with women's history of this area, please share it with me because that's what I'm trying to learn and that's what I want to be my specialty area now that I'm here in this part of the country. So. Why is it unusual? Well, most people, when you talk about ladies in the Civil War, they flash in their mind the great big plantation pall gowns and someone helping them dress and pulling their corset tight and doing their clothing up so it's spotless. Well, as you'll notice when we start holding things up, none of these are ironed. Now, I know how to iron, ladies, believe you know me. <laughs> I grew up ironing. But that would not be appropriate. If I came to you with every single one of these items ironed and starched and looking absolutely you'd say, oh, is that real? Well, it isn't real. So as you, we show you things and and do a few little quick changes here and talk about things on our table, you'll begin to see why. First of all, what was this country when it was first settled? Swampland. All right, I really have enjoyed making trips out to the Cypress uh, Dog Trot House. And uh, I've gotten a lot of information about that from Dr. Nichols because they didn't live with a lot of dry high ground around them. They didn't break sod like we did in, the, in Iowa. They lived in water. They had wood slats that they tried to go from different areas in their, quote, ground to their homes. Now, like I said, I'm not the expert on this. I'm the learner, but you may correct me or share it any time that you like. But when you think about that, would you want to wear a hoop out in the mud? Now, I grew up on a river in Waterloo, Iowa, and my home more than once was flooded. And we had to go from our home to higher ground in boats. So I have a little bit of an orientation of what some of that might be like. Uh, 
I also was a pastor's wife, and our first churches had no well. We had to carry water for three days at a time and carry it to the church. I had to make sure I separated water for what it was going to be used for, so I kept my children healthy. So some of that I do have a little bit of an orientation to, but not like the women of that day did. So the first thing that I have on is an apron, and we'll talk about, Rebecca will do a lot more of the talking than I can do anymore. But she'll talk about the gauging, and after the program you can come up, and none of this is anything you have to wear white gloves with except the hats. We'd prefer you let us show you the, the bonnets. Uh, but the rest of it, you can pick it up and look at it. Gauging was a way of, a method of pleating. And so we'll talk a little bit about that more now. But anyway, aprons were worn a lot. So I'm going to take off my gown, my apron, and show you one of the first things. Now, if I told you I was going to put on a fashion show for Civil War women and put this on, what would you think? <laughs> my glory! <laughs> Well, this was a typical work dress. And if I was working, should we go around yeah. the other table? If I was working out in my yard, whether it was muddy all around me, and I was going to cook snake for dinner, I might not have this long skirt on. <laughs> Instead, I would have a shorter skirt on, and my shorter skirt, you would see my pantaloons. <laughs> and all I have done, yeah, stand up if you can. I'll, I can't move around very well, so you'll have to move around to see me, maybe. But anyway, that would be a typical work dress. Now, you stop and think a minute. Would you want to go out in your garden and work with a hoop skirt on? <laughs> corseted up, and first of all, you probably couldn't get corseted up unless you had somebody help you tie it in it. <laughs> when Rebecca and I do Civil War reenacting, and we, it takes both of us to get corsets on each other. <laughs> so that is one of the unordinary fashions. Not only that, the women didn't have a wardrobe of eight or ten dresses. They were lucky a lot of times if they had one garment. And so, if someone came riding in and you wanted to at least look appropriate because you didn't want your ankles to show, you might go in the house and have another skirt. Now, I have a picture of a barn loom. I would love to own it, but the lady wanted way too much for, for it. But anyway, it was a huge loom that sat in the barn that they wove their clothing fabric on. I do have a loom that is 32 inches wide that I could wind and weave fabric to make fabric for clothing for myself. So even though they could buy fabric and it would come up the river and it would be very large boats, it would only be probably 30, 32, 36 at the most wide, it would be 20 yards maybe on a boat. So they could have fabric. You'd buy a bolt, and when it came, you got whatever you got, and that was it. And so I could have enough fabric to make me one top, two skirts, and take some of what was left over to put on the bottom of my pantaloons. So if, if you actually pull it up, you can see where it goes, the white is. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised to see how full the skirts are. 
too. A lot of fat, a lot of extra fabric there. Yeah. Yes. How, how much? How much fab? So that's twenty yards. And, and no, all this that? isn't twenty yards. Uh -huh. um, a typical, a typical long skirt. Now she could put this over uh, a hoop skirt under it if she wanted to, um, but typically the skirts were. Um, anywhere from 90 inches circumference to 120 is what a typical hoop is, 120 inches. So um, it would take it takes about three yards of fabric to um, make your skirt for like that. And it depends upon how tall you are too, because right. I'm. It takes me five yards of fabric to make a skirt because I'm so much taller. When we plan a dress for her, we plan 10 yards for her. When I plan one for me, I plan about eight. So I'm, I'm shorter armed, I'm, I'm shorter in height. Um, my waist isn't, you know, my waist through here isn't as long as what hers is. So it's, and we, you know, that's pretty much about what it is. And, and everything you see up here made, I've done some of the work, but Rebecca has made all of these items, including all of the bonnets that are over there. All of the underwear. Thank you. I'm a proud mama. Yes. Excuse my ignorance, but no. is, the, is the nine yards, is the width of it standard? Well, our, I mean, we're just, using, we're using modern, modern fabric, yeah. so our fabrics are 45 inches wide. Um, and this, my skirts are a little bit probably fuller than what originals are, um, just because it's easier for me just to go salvage to salvage. I don't cut down and make 36 inches and cut off that extra. So, um, but their fabrics were, they could, were only able to weave, um, I mean, generally 36 was the rule of thumb for the width of their fabrics. Um, and that held true up um, through like the 1920s when things got more, even more mechanized and bigger. Um, so. Do you want to start showing the sure. different clothing? So let me start, yeah, let me start. So we've kind of talked about the unusual a little bit. Um, Another, since we're kind of on work dresses at first, this is another work dress that, um, and kind of you can see it's not quite so wide and full. This is a work dress that was worn by a lady named Wanda Wyatt that um, were, was, it is a exact copy of her dress from the museum in Wisconsin, the um, Historical Society in Wisconsin. And it does have a pocket in it. A lot of people don't think they had pockets, but there is a, if I can find it. There is a, well, we can find it later. There is a pocket in the dress. Um, and this is a one piece dress. A lot of work dresses were one piece. It was um, easier to wear, um, more practical than having the two pieces um, together, you know, put layered over top. So, um, and this dates from about 1848. So this is a little bit pre-Civil War. Now, the one thing with Civil War fashions too is that all of the arms are piped. There's a little bit of piping in every arm hole in the arm side. And um, they also were... Why? Um, Why piping? Piping helped reinforce that stress and the stress. It also gave a little bit of a decorative um, to it. When, uh, prior to the Civil War, um, fab uh, fabrics were pretty much all, um, it, at least here in the United States, were pretty much dark because they had to dye them with uh, natural dyes um, and the dyes didn't last over a period of time. The other thing, if you get into quilting, I know some of my quilter friends are here, they also, what you had to set the dyes with would eventually erode away the fabrics. And it, over time and light exposure, it changes the color of the fabrics. 
Um, so everything was pretty dark. Um, everything was pretty much like what they call a homespun, which would be um, a solid fabric. Um, a, they could do a plaid by different colors of thread. Um, this is what is typically known as a homespun, even though it's a plaid. It's um, not like a polished, real polished cotton look. Um, so this is, I mean, this is a typical uh, work dress. And it's attached just because of the ease of being able to get dressed in and out of it, move around. You don't have to worry about your, you know, your uh, top coming up and exposing, you know, what you have underneath. And you can pretty much function and get your stuff done. Um, this is an item called a wrapper. And I can slip this on. This is actually hers, so it's going to be kind of long for you. <clears throat> but they, they button down the, the front. This is what typically was a, a house coat. Um, so it's also gauged across the whole back to get your, to get your width in. They are all totally lined. Everything's lined. Yeah, everything's lined. This doesn't fit me as well because it's, it's almost too small for me because it's hers. And, and they did line them? That they did cute. line them because it helped with perspiration, absorbing the perspiration that you have, and trying to help keep the outer fabric that you maybe spent more time in, in weaving, or you um, maybe you actually purchased it. It helped um, with that. So, Did you make that too? Yes. This is, this is a trim. They did a lot of self-trimming on, on clothing with um, the fabric that they had. So that's another reason why, you know, if they bought a bolt, they would, um, you might make yourself a dress as your mom, as the mother. If you had a little girl or two little girls with the rest of that, you'd make dresses out of that same fabric. And there are pictures out, I've got some pictures saved on pin, off Pinterest, and there's, of actual Civil War photographs that um, there's a mother and like three or four little girls of different ages, they're all in the, the girls are all in the same dress, <laughs> I'm like identical dresses. And so they would, they would, they'd buy a whole bolt of fabric and then they'd make clothes for the whole family. Um, you might make a shirt for your husband out of the fabric and a dress for yourself. So um, that's, but this was, this was kind of like their house coat if you were um, if what? you weren't feeling well that a particular day, if you had morning sickness and you didn't feel like dressing, um, you might wear something like this. Also, this is something that the more affluent would wear. Um, a lot of times, it, you in some movies you see them like sitting up in their sitting rooms and they don't get dressed until noon. Um, or if they're, they're in their, I'll say, womanly time of the month, um, they might not get dressed at all. They might not even come down at all for three or four days. Um, if you were, say, like in the South or out East or something and had some servants that could wait on you, um, you, would, you would wear this as your house coat all day long. You might put on a nice petticoat to wear underneath of it, and you can tell this is like too long for me. But you, and then you would just, you would button it down to like here and then you just wear the rest unbuttoned, okay? And Rebecca and I made the petticoat. Yeah. That is lovely. Yeah. <laughs> He's a little repair to it, but it is what it is. <laughs> so, and that is, that's, that's one that we made for her. Um, You know, if you, if you had um, a close friend, you were feeling well and you had a, um, some people come to visit you, um, some friends come to visit you, uh, you might be just in that and you'd receive them um, very close friends upstairs in your sitting room. So, and this was acceptable, but you didn't receive gentlemen in, or men in this at all. You would have to dress. 
this is a this is an actual this is a child more of a child or young lady's um, chemise. This was worn kind of like a slip, what we think of a slip nowadays. Um, this is this is an actual one. This is the one that I made for myself. You can see the same kind of a pattern to it. First has a little bit of a gathered sleeve, kind of a line. It sits off the shoulders a little bit. Um, you can also wear this. I can actually wear this under a ball gown if I wanted to. So, and that's why they always were pretty much like just right on the shoulder. They didn't really come up the neck. Um, and then, so you would have this on. This is my pair of pantaloons, they were called. Um, drawers was a term that came in later after the Civil War. Um, and you'll notice, what about them? <laughs> um, it's kind of shocking to think that it's not closed, but if you it's this is how they warm. It's very practical for one. If you think that you're in, okay, say you're out east, you are in your dress, you have this under it, okay. If they are closed. How are you, and you have this on, you have your chemise on, these are under your chemise. Your chemise comes over them like this. Okay. Take it to your arms because the bathroom. Exactly. <laughs> and what else? You're going to need to have somebody help you go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> so then you have your corset around you, and your corset's going to come around like this, okay? You're going to be all cinched in. <laughs> it's easy just to drop your drawers, right? <laughs> the other thing that um, we don't think about is um, they didn't have really public restrooms like we do now. We don't have a McDonald's. They didn't have a McDonald's. They'd go in and while they were out doing their errands or shopping or whatever that they could go in and use a restroom. Um, you, if you were out shopping with your friends for the day in town and you needed to go to the restroom, you had to go back home. Okay? Um, or if, um, you know, you were with a friend maybe that lived closer to town, all of you might go to her house, if she's a close friend, and you go to the restroom there. But your restrooms aren't inside, okay? They're in an outhouse, even in the most fanciest houses, they were in an outhouse, okay? Um, they did, some of the very, very eccentric, um, very rich people might have a porcelain pot that maybe fit in an apparatus they had somebody make that resembled a chair, so you could use that. But that was very, very rare, okay? So you pretty much had, had to go to the, out, you know, to the outside, outside back. or you, in, in this area, you really literally just picked out a tree. Okay? <laughs> and um, that was another reason why, you know, men are always like, why do women always have to go to the bathroom in pairs? Well, that's why you went to the bathroom in pairs, okay? And you protected one another. You talk about your big skirts came in handy because if you were with a friend of yours, then you help protect them, and they then help protect you so that no one could come around and catch you unaware. So the skirts were more than good for one reason <laughs> <laughs> so um and this is this is a typical course 1860s typical corset um this uh this front piece down here is called a bust a b-u-s-k um and it is a was an invention that um came about in the around the 1840s actually that allowed women to be able to get into their corset by themselves. It was revolutionary for women. Um, you still have ties in the back, 
But now um, you, with this, once you have it on, somebody ties you in back here, and you get it set to what your body is, then you can just undo it like this at night or whatever, and then you can easily put it on by yourself in during the day. You know? Did they make those things? Mm -hmm. The Rebecca made mm -hmm. both of these. Now, this one's way too small for me. I can't wear it anymore. But it basically sets about like that. Um, if it's, you know, situated there, then you can snap it in front. So, you know, if your husband was at the office, you know, he might put you in it, you know, at the beginning of the week after you washed it, you know, and then you just let it, you, it kept where it was in the back, and you could get in and out of it as you needed to, you know, through the week and stuff. Um, so or like me, of, you just didn't wear any. Yeah, a lot of women, a lot of women didn't even wear them, uh, especially older women, uh, because they, I mean, they are constricting. Now you have to remember that you started wearing these from the time you were a small child. So your body, um, was conformed and didn't really grow so much. I mean, you'd grow as you needed to, and they'd make you you get a new corset, but you didn't really have a lot of the you know growing and and stuff like that. You pretty much stayed in a in a size as you became an adult your whole life for the most part. Um, so that's, you need to move on, that's kind of the undergarment stuff. Now this is a typical um, day dress, and this is what everybody thinks of as a Civil War dress. Um, it, has, it has the hoop skirt underneath of it, and then you wear at least one petticoat to cover up all of the hoop boning, because this was actually whale boning in the beginning, and you would cover that up to get a nice smooth effect over it. And you might wear two or three petticoats over that, um, two. Sometimes I wear at least two. I wear at least two, sometimes three. In the winter, I might wear three <coughs> if I have a cotton dress. Um, this is a dress that is, um, this was kind of toward the end of the <coughs> Civil War, about 1863, 64. This is a, this is a skirt that is um, just knife, what they call knife pleated or box pleated. Um, this dress doesn't have anything at the back to fasten it. Um, we just use a straight pin because they use straight pins. That's all they had. They didn't have safety pins. Safety pins hadn't been invented. They had buttons, um, but if you were older, you might not be able to manipulate the buttons as easy. A safety pin or a straight pin was easier, so you might straight pin yourself in. Um, some of the older, some of the older, there's accounts of some of the older ladies that were older as they went through the Civil War because they didn't have buttons, and like as they were growing up, they weren't used to them, they didn't want to change, so they just always pinned themselves in their clothes. Um, but the skirt on this is a little bit elliptical, if you can see. It's a little bit higher, if I hold it this way, maybe you can see it. It's a little bit higher in the front than the back. Okay, so it kind of it kind of swooped out the back a little bit more, and they did make some uh, different hoop skirts for those. Um, this one has a peplum. Peplums became popular throughout the Civil War, so this one has a peplum to it. And it comes around here at the front, so that's with tassels. This was done off of a um, plate, a, a photographic plate of a lady that was. In a dress similar to that, we did. Um, this is a typical skirt from the 1850s. Fashion changed from 1840, uh, 1850. Things changed a little bit. Um, they got a lot of layers to the skirts, um, and uh, their bodices changed a little bit. Their tops changed a little bit. This is a these, no, these few through here are a little bit more fancier. Um, if you were maybe a little more affluent, you might have something like this. Uh, if you lived out east, you might have something like this. 
It's did all snaps. There's no buttons. Did you make that? Yes. Every it's single thing red. she's showing you, ladies and gentlemen, she made. It's a it's a gather. It's basically called a gathered bodice. It all fits so down not here. Be easy. No, it's not. That's why I <laughs> And all of all of this is sewn on. Yes. Is it for him? Um, I do the I do the clothing by machine. Um, some of the application is by hand. All of the gauging around the skirts, on the aprons, things like that, that's all done by hand. Um, the pleating's all done the, by hand. When does the sewing machine come into existence? The sew, there was a sewing machine that was, um, they were invented about the latter half of the 1840s. Um, but your average woman would not have one. Correct. Your average so woman would not. Sewing. Yeah, or your average so your average woman would have had to sew these garments all by hand. Yes, yes, um, yes. A, a sewing machine at the time cost around about a hundred dollars, which was quite a little bit then. Yes. Um, the first machines were very expensive. As the um, patent for the machine, as they built the machines and people learned about them, and other inventors looked at them and came up with their own idea. There were a lot of different machines out there available. Um, Singer wasn't actually one of the first ones made, um, but he, he was one of the first ones to mass produce it because he had, his motto was that, you know, there should be one in every home. So he was one of the first ones though to start mass producing and it, that lowered the price a little bit um, and women were able to afford him a little bit. Um, this first sewing machine did a chain stitch. I don't know if you're all familiar with what a chain stitch is. Um, and then as machines were perfected and even more mass produced after the Civil War in the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, they became the interlocking stitch that we know them today. So um, Chain stitch is like you used to have on your flower sacks well, and you everything still do, you like just on the pull dog it. food sacks the way you just kind of pull it and it all comes so it was you know it it held your clothes but a lot of people still hand sewed things now i didn't have i mean when we first started some of these i had to make like within a couple days so i didn't have time to sit and hand sew a, a shirt a dress sure. that is a goal of mine i do want to hand sew a couple um and I have, um, for about, oh, 15 years, I've been looking around for, I've always wanted a machine from that period that did chain stitch. And I, um, I was able to do some um, searching on the internet and I found one, and now I've found out that they're out there a lot more than I ever thought that they were. Um, they're pretty prevalent out there right now. And um, so I do have a machine uh, from the, that was uh, manufactured in, um, 1849 and she had that in her display yeah we had a display out here I don't know if any of you saw it and that was in the display um, and it's a goal of mine to make some dresses for us off that machine so to actually really get back more to the pure way that they made them to have to be able to show people um, so this is this is a and this um, is another actual reproduction pattern of someone that had one out. It's by, uh, by the Historical Society as well. Is that rick-rack on that bodice? No, ma'am, it's um, lace. Pardon? It's lace. Okay, it's couldn't lace. do it from here. Yeah, it's lace. Um, you wanna hear the they really didn't have rick-rack until about 18, uh, that's what I was about, until 1920 was when rick-rack really came. Oh, that's where I was going. Yeah. Um, the other thing I have done is I have, um, in getting into the bonnets and making those, I have wanted to learn how to make my own lace because you really didn't go out and buy lace like they did. Everything was handmade. So I have learned and taught myself how to make lace. And um, I'm in the process of making some lace to put on bonnets. She also does bobbin lace. I'm kind of a, what they call a purist and I really like the real authentic look. So this is a skirt that has a fancy bottom um, I got this, uh, saw this in a magazine, a uh, ladies magazine of the period. Um, it was just a small little line drawing at the bottom of the page. They would give you 
um, maybe a paisley pattern that you could embroider on something. They would give you, uh, they give a lot of line drawings of things. Um, this was a, just a like, little line drawing at the, across the bottom of the page that was labeled trim, okay? So it was a trim idea for ladies at that time to use, however you saw fit. Um, at the time I made this, we had learned about a skirt called a turn skirt. And a turn skirt was a skirt that either something had happened to the bottom of it, okay? Maybe it had gotten frayed from dragging on the ground and through the mud. Maybe it had gotten caught on your wagon wheel and ripped a hole in it. Um, maybe it was a skirt that you had when you were 14 and since your waist size never changed but you grew taller, it was, and the fabric was still good, it was something that you could use and have another skirt for another option. So it might be too short for you. So you needed to lengthen it to get some length down to the bottom so your ankles didn't show. And so what I came up with was putting, the, and it kind of came about because I loved this fabric, but I didn't have very much of it. I only had, so I, I couldn't make, you know, three panels around as long as I needed. I had to cut it and only make it three panels around short, which wouldn't work. So, so I came up with this, used the line drawing to make the top, and cut out a width wide enough, and then sewed it around the bottom to make the skirt wearable and usable, the fabric usable. Um, turn skirts were also, also came about because if you um, damaged your skirt at the bottom, uh, this one doesn't have it. That one does. You could, well, this one isn't quite as much, but you, you could put in fabric that was the same, I think the one you have on is. Um, but anyway, you basically just fold it over. When you first originally made it, you would figure it maybe, you know, six inches longer than what your hem length was. Here. Okay. And then you'd pull it up at the top. Yeah, that's a little bit more. Well, that's, that's not quite either. Yeah, I know it. Anyway. You can explain it. This is one. This is more like it. So anyway, you've got some extra fabric here that you've kind of built into the, to this garment. And if, you, if your skirt got caught and ripped and you know, you couldn't really fix it or it was a big enough that you couldn't really do anything with, what you might do is take it all off the waistband, undo all this, all your gathers, whatever type of gathers you have on, open this fabric up, okay, so it's flat. Mm -hmm. Then you would regather, you might take another piece of fabric, sew it on, you know, sew it onto the very end of it up here into the seam turn it over and regather it all. So you basically lengthened your skirt like six inches or four inches, whatever you've needed. And skirts weren't, skirts had a different piece on the bottom here for a hem. Um, so if this got dirty and you, you could take it off, wash it, put it back on, or you could change it out easy. And then you flip the skirt and now this, it's not quite as nice here goes into all the pleating up through here, and what so was up don't. here at the pleating now goes to the bottom of the skirt to give you a nicer look to it so, so that was really what flipping a skirt was about because you left turn enough skirt. yeah turn skirt um, you see you just didn't waste a thing yeah this is a this is a look side going with this skirt that I made um, this look and this became fashionable actually during the real Civil War is a skirt and a top that was a different color. It also allowed you to get a little bit more use out of your clothes and it showed support through the war. Um, this particular shirt is called a Garibaldi shirt. It came into fashion from the, um, there were fighters that came over from uh, huh? Italy. Italy. And um, they were 
called Garibaldi soldiers. Their typical um, dress was a shirt similar to this that had some fancy work down the sleeves and um, sometimes around the shirt and the cuff, the shirt sleeve cuff. Um, it was usually white and they wore red, um, kind of like bloomer pants that would tuck into the two gaiters that went around their legs. And then they wore a jacket, it was usually a blue jacket, and it was, a, it was kind of like a bolero jacket that we might think of today. And it had um, big sleeves like this to it. So some of them did. So this became a, this became a uh, fashion that women, that the younger women adopted because one, they, didn't, they wanted to show support for the war. They didn't want to look like their parents. They wanted to be a little bit more modern. And um, so they made this. And then I, and the trim on this is a typical Garibaldi type trim that I, you can't see it unless you come up close. It's black, um, it's black on black. So, and it's all hand sewn on there. You I had can to come up after. Yeah, you can handle up anything you want. Um, so this was, this was typical. Um, I made a Garibaldi, I made a couple Garibaldi shirts. This is one I made to go with this outfit. Um, I made to go with this fabric. This is a fabric I found I really liked, but there was only enough to make a skirt. So I had to decide what to do to make an outfit. So I made a, another Garibaldi shirt out of a linen. And I did stitching. This is counted cross stitch weight off waist, waist canvas and did all the stitching around it to decorate it out. So then I have that, and I can wear the jacket with that if I want, um, or I can wear it with I could wear it with this outfit. This is a this is a kind of a version of the blue dress. It's called a Swiss bodice. Did they have the bobbers there? They did. Trim was trim was pretty big. They did a lot of trim if they could get it. If not, they would use fabric and make self trim, like off of the dressing gown. Um, they yes. do self-trim around the skirts, very elaborate self-trims. Um, this is just a, another uh, top that I can wear with either, either uh, this skirt. I can wear it with this skirt if I want. It's kind of wild, but there's a, an actual photograph I have. I can pull them up later if you're interested and want to see the originals. Um, a photograph I have of a lady. She has a print. She actually has a print skirt on, with a white and black striped top. <coughs> Pretty different. So it gives me a little bit more um, clay with my uh, outfits that don't have to have so much fabric. Feel like I have a new dress. You know, maybe I can't afford a whole new dress, so I just make a top. You know. Um, they also had. Um, sleeves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are just a. Uh, Those are an over sleeve for my Civil War. No, these are my sleeves for. Oh, under my I'm tank. sorry. Your sleeves. If you wanted a. You know, you had a jacket like this. You can kind of see the sleeves are kind of a. Oh. Kind of a trumpeted mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. You actually wanted them to stand out to kind of sit around. So you would wear this sleeve underneath. This sleeve would be starched, really heavily starched. And you'd wear the sleeve and it would hold your, hold your top out, your sleeve out. Um, they also had these as um, over sleeves as the, war, as the war became and women started nursing in the war. Um, you would wear, you didn't have a uniform you wore your typical day dress or work dress into um, the hospital or wherever they have the soldiers. Um, you would make a sleeve similar to this. You could, you could pull it around like this. We also have some that you just put a straight pin here and here. They're not quite as full. Um, and you put that over your dress so it protects your dress Here's when you're in sleeve. taking care of everybody. Mm -hmm. Here's her sleeves that aren't quite so full. 
So you would, you know, just slip it up like this, protect your breasts, you take care of people. Now, how much it's really going to protect the dress, really, but, you know. Well, you there. starch those you really, really stiff with starch. And the starch then acts as a, a resist or a barrier for all of that medical waste that gets uh, into your clothing. Right. And so when I reenacted as a... And then you'd have to cover your hair some way so you'd make a little puff up with hair. <laughs> and that is from an actual that's picture. A, that's a very typical nursing uniform. So, and they had to provide... Nurses back then, they first weren't even allowed. There was a lot of men didn't want them in the in the hospitals and there was a lot of, you know, resistance from society for women to come in in the beginning of the war. But as the war went longer, um, they realized they were going to have to do something because all the men were going to fight and, and they had a lot more injuries than they ever thought they had. Um, you know, they, the political mechanism of the time thought that the war was only going to last maybe three months. You know, it lasted three and a half, four years. So um, society's expectations changed a lot as the war went on. And more and more <coughs> men came home with some injuries and, and things like that. So um, women had to provide their own uniforms. There wasn't any kind of a uniform store you could go out and buy a uniform at. You know? So. Did that make for buttons on oyster shells? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that mainly what they made them out of? Nope, they made them out of wood. The or, blue dress has them out of wood if you yeah, want to look at it. Yeah, do different things and you can come up and look. Um, they made them out of horn, uh, animal horn, uh, wood. Uh, if you lived along a river or the Mississippi, if you get oysters, they would make them out of oyster shells. Clam shells. Clam shells, um, you know, to give that mother a look. They did make some out of metal. Um, after the war, like through the war and well, after the this war. One's out of Some of the military, the, you know, like the military buttons were brass. Um, you could make them out of that. Uh, tin, they had tin buttons. They could stand off their own little tin buttons if they had some tin. So, um, buttons, buttons were a little bit more, I mean, the common person had access to buttons, but they, you know, you had to spend to get them a little bit. Um, so, they, that's one reason why a lot of people just still straight pin, you know. Uh, not that straight pins were easy to come by, and you know all straight pins were basically made by hand then, so they were kind of expensive, but to buy, but you could get them. So um, Rebecca, do you want to come? Straight up? pin, you could use uh, the same straight pins on every, you know, maybe you had a couple dresses, you could use the same straight pins. It wasn't like buttons that you had to dedicate to that dress. So things like that. You want to come down to yeah. the bonnets because so, um, it's you've got okay. fifteen minutes. Okay. Long. So this is this is a pair of shoes, of younger ladies' shoes, or even old. You know, um, do they have right and left feet? Or this pair have? actually does have right and left feet. This pair does not. So, um, this pair this pair is probably a little bit of later through the Civil War with the elastic in it. Now these both are reproduction pairs from a gentleman from Canada that does um, authentic reproductions. Um, this is a side, what they call a side lacing. So, um, and then they did have boots that were similar. Um, they were, would be straight toed, like everything was straight toed through the Civil War and then. But those are like your typical, um, like high button come, come. or the laced. Um, so. Rebecca likes a lot of the different things, but these are the typical. Laced Your typical, up. you know, are laced they boot. Pardon? Are they comfortable? Yes, they are. And the other thing, I told Rebecca to move on. Here I am, but um, the corset is really comfortable. I have had a lot of back surgery and back problems, and I really, for a while, would wear those to work every day because they would be comfortable on my back doing nursing. Great. 
they would have made you stand up? They did, they but they also said. gave me that support yes. in through yes. here. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, honey. Um, so the, um, we'll move on to like the head garments. You, you basically always had to have your head covered. Um, the, if you, if you were dark complected, like tanned, what it showed that you had to work for your living. So it wasn't as desired, even if you did have to work for your living, you wanted to look like you didn't, you know? <laughs> so you kept your head covered at all times. And it was just society that you, a woman had to have her head covered. So like even in the home, even in the home, you would wear a covering. Mm -hmm. It also too was because you didn't shower every day like you do now. You probably bathe once a week if you're lucky. And so it helped to keep dirt and that off your hair to keep it a little bit cleaner. This is a outside um, bonnet. Uh, you, this is kind of typical to what you would use maybe in your garden if you went gardening or if you um, were in the Midwest here on the prairie. Um, it's, cor it's all corded. This is made off of a, an original that we found. <laughs> So it comes out, comes out over your head, kind of protect your head a little bit, your face, protects your shoulders. It also protects your garment a little bit from the sun and, and that. Um, big, everything had big ties. It's like, it's not really practical, but they just did. They had big ties. So, you know, like that. Um, and I've made a couple different ones. This is one, this is the one she wears. She wanted something a little bit more subdued. This was a fabric I fell in love with and wanted something a little more flashy. <laughs> We've got stuff in there from the display. So that's mine, a little bit more flashy. So you also had, this one I didn't ever get it in. You also, um, a lot of originals had a piece in it of the fabric that they would, a strip of the fabric that they would just sew into the, Garment. So if you got a rip in it or got a hole and you wanted to mend it, you could actually take a little corner out of this, you know, turn it around, turn all the edges under and mend it. And it would, war as you wash the item, uh, it would launder at the same rate as your original fabric. And they could hang on to it too. You didn't like, where did I put that? I don't know where I put that. So it stayed with the garment. Um, we found that, we didn't find that, we have found that so much in clothing, but we have found it in some of the workwear, the headwear stuff. And this is called, uh, this particular type of style is called a slat bonnet. Um, you could, they, a lot of the people going west use these because they could roll them up, stick them in their, you know, pocket in their wagon, whatever, at night after the sun went down. Um, they actually used, they actually did, they had some cardboard, they could use cardboard slats in it um, to keep the stiffness. Um, you could use like thin wood slats, almost like what we have as shims nowadays, you could use that. Um, it's also flat. The other one we had pinched and intact, but you could leave it flat and then you just take a straight pin, pin it up with a straight pin to kind of give it some shape around your head. That way you could launder it easier. If it's flat, you can launder it easier than if there's plates in it. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. You guys can try these on, I don't care what these. So it came, you know, you'd pinch it like that. It would come out, stand out around your And then head. there's another tie so. that tied around the back of your neck. Yeah. You could if you wanted. So that the one thing with this is you can't, you don't have a lot of peripheral vision with it. If you put it on, it's kind of different. So when you, when you want to talk to somebody, you actually have to turn your head, you know. But it protects a lot of the sun in that. So that's that. Um, this is a typical... Pretty typical uh, day cap. Um, older ladies wore caps that were more like that. Um, younger ladies wanted something that was probably a little more fashionable, not like what their grandmothers wore. So um, there was a lot of patterns for these in the ladies' um, magazines. 
lawn drawings and I mean pages and pages and pages of them. Um, this just kind of clips, I put combs in it to make it accessible. But you just kind of flatten it out like this, clip it in. So, you know. Um, this is another one that is just, it's all white. You would just literally take a pin and pin it through your hair up here. And these little, these like are called little lapel, like lapels. And they actually, you didn't tie it, they just hung free for the fashion of it. Um, this, item, this item, back to the clothes, this is a, um, what they called an undersleeve crinoline. So if I wanted that dress to puff out, the sleeves to puff out, and there were a lot of different sleeve styles um, in fashion at that time. Um, some were straight, like kind of like a coat type sleeve, very tight fitting coat sleeve. That um, ones on that, on this dress, on this blouse here, they're called a bishop style, if you're interested. But you might, if you wanted it to stand out, you'd tie on a, this would be starched, really heavily starched, like your petticoat and your apron and that. And you'd tie that on and it'd puff out like this and it'd hold your sleeves out. So. Um, Okay, so the bonnets, um, bonnets were changed through the periods. Um, this is a bonnet from around 1840. Okay. Um, very high up here, kind of comes around, ties. It's got, it just has caning around the buckram to hold it. It's not really heavily stitched. Um, this is a bonnet called a drawn bonnet. These were pretty popular. Um, these kind of came in more around 1862, 1863. You could have it very plain like this. It's a, it's a buckram shape and you uh, make little like channels in your fabric and then you run caning in these little channels and gather the fabric all up and stitch it on. So I've done one like this. This is the first one I ever did. This is another one I did, and I wanted to decorate, decorate it up, make it a little fancier. So I took the peacock feathers and um, the flowers. They did a lot of trims on their flowers. Uh, they would have actual bonnet trimming parties, the women would. And um, if you had like a church social, it might be something that you do is have a bonnet trimming party during the church social. And you would bring different trims that you had. Um, you would take your bonnets, the trims off all your bonnets, and you would trade them with each other. And then you could decorate, and you'd have like a, you'd have basically a new bonnet, you know. So um, some of the literature says um, that a bonnet should look as light as a feather; that it should just blow away in a light wind. So. Um, the, they also had born, uh, bonnets for mourning. Uh, mourning became uh, very in vogue, actually in vogue with the death of Prince Albert. Uh, Queen Victoria never left, uh, or always grieved him, never came out of a mourning state. And with, uh, there was mourning, but it wasn't as widely adhered to until the Civil War with everybody, you knew, like half your community might die in the Civil War, the men. So everybody was in mourning at some point. Um, there were stages of mourning that you would have, uh, depending on how you knew the person that died. Uh, if you were a sister, you might observe a one-year mourning period. If you were a niece or a nephew of, like your aunt died, you might, or a fr so, like a friend in the community died, you might show mourning in support for that family, but you would only do mourning for maybe six, six months, and then you would come out of mourning. Or you would be, over your year, if you were in for a year, over your year period, you would have, what they have different stages of mourning. So you might wear certain colors for the first three months, all black. Um, as you get to month four and five, you would add in a little purple, to the wardrobe, um, and 
you know, like by maybe month nine, you're in white and black, which is half mourning. And then at the end of the year, you come out and you just dress however you normally dressed. So these bonnets, and I say that because these two bonnets are um, period, period reproduction, exact period reproductions of two half mourning bonnets. The, I, I did these off of plates out of Godey's magazine, women's magazine. All I had was a short half um, paragraph description of what they looked like and a little bit of a picture, a line picture, and I made them. So this, was a, this is one that has a, like a curtain and a little bit fancy with the bobbles. These are both half mornings. So. And we wore those to the Lincoln. We were, while we were living in um, Wisconsin, we uh, started joining a group up in Minnesota, at the Historical Society in Minnesota. And um, they're a very purist, what we call a very purist group. Um, and they, they did a reenactment in uh, Chicago of Lincoln's funeral procession that came through <laughs> Chicago. And they actually had a, uh, a horse-drawn hearse, and uh, somebody had reproduced the casket that Lincoln was buried, that traveled on the train through the United States. Um, and it had a big stop in Chicago. They did a very big um, processional through a cemetery, and um, they had, you know, like women dressed in half mourning that. <laughs> that followed behind his procession, um, different, you know, different things to make this like a really big deal then. And uh, so we, I made these, we were invited to go to that and participate, so. When was that? That was back in the early 90s, I think it, they did it. Because they just had, they just had the, the 150 yeah. anniversary. Yeah, yeah. This, this what it wasn't really, um, it, you know, well publicized. It was a very um, kind of a you know an invited type of an event um, that they were doing. The one they just did was at Springfield, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, just this bonnet. If you notice, it's very different than this bonnet. Okay, this is a bonnet from 1864, and like I said again, as fat as as. Time went on, fashions progressed. Um, younger women didn't want to look like their mothers and their grandmothers and um, have bonnets that had, uh, this piece is called a curtain, and it goes, it goes across the back of your neck and helps protect the back of your neck from the sun, so to keep the back of your neck fair looking. So they didn't like the curtain, they didn't like the big full shape, they wanted to go to something smaller, more demure, more modern. So they dropped, they dropped the curtain. Some of them kept the shape, but they just shortened the curtain, or they dropped the curtain altogether. Um, so this one kind of goes on like this, just sits at the top. So there's not much really to protect the back of my head, cover my head. You know, my hair is going to show, things like that. Um, this is, uh, this is a um, opera bonnet, what was called an opera bonnet. Very fancy, different shape. Um, and then this is, we brought this, um, this is a period parasol. Um, it also helped with keeping the sun out of your eyes, keeping your skin fair. Um, if you were out in a carriage, because pretty much everything was open carriage if you had a carriage, you know, that hot sun beating down on you. Um, you didn't really have sunglasses like we have nowadays. So the women would carry parasols. Um, they were very small. You had, um, and they had, a, within society, you observed a very strict code of proximity to other people. Um, you're, you have a, they defined a personal space that each person had was about 18 inches, which is about the size of your shoulders. You know, it's about the size of your shoulders. It doesn't go out much up. So the parasols were very small. So they, if you were in a carriage riding, 
you could have this here if your husband was sitting here you even though you're married you're a husband and wife but you don't want to invade their personal space so it's very small so it doesn't bother them um, and you could still carry on a conversation if you and your sister were riding together you know and protect yourself um, the other thing that these parasols did and they're called carriage parasols is because they turn okay a lot of people if they have these they think oh that's broken it's like no it's not broken it carriages it's supposed to do that so you could you know if my mom was sitting here I could do this it wouldn't stick out quite so much and you know we could converse and I could put it wherever I needed to to cover the Sun coming in um, parasols were typically black because of all the mourning that was going on things like that it's a very basic easy color um, they do get very fancy um, some of the handles are bone very intricately carved bone um, coral um, some of them are different colors there's brown there's white um, they're covered with silk so the silks can get pretty um, flashy um, they also had them with white a white lining inside instead of the black you might have black outside white inside you might carry something like that if you're in half mourning you could carry that um, they had lace covers like handmade bobbin laced covers that would go over the tops of them you could get so very fancy and kind of you know a, a fashion it was a way for women to express their fashion sense and that because women didn't have a lot of rights and a lot of abilities so through time if you study fashion and over time that's really how women were able to express their opinions is through fashion and what they did so do you have any questions i know we've covered a lot rebecca's do you know what went into making the starch that they would have used was it sugar water or what they used a lot of potato starch, potato starch. Mm -hmm. um, sugar was very expensive back then and was a, like a high commodity uh, so um, they used a lot of potato water um, for starch they just you know save the water off of them making potatoes and whatever and then they dilute it down as they needed to or um, they did use some corn, corn starches they had corn starches that you can make them out of corn starch I've done that so I haven't done any potato water but so the lady here honey oh, oh I'm sorry. Sorry. go ahead sorry no go ahead you referred to the dresses of various types approximately your research how long do one of these dresses last I can see them get worn out pretty fast usually they... usually you got a dress every year hopefully you got a new dress every year that was kind of the uh, goal norm you know if you got a new dress every year you were pretty pretty good pretty well off that's what I figured yeah yeah I'm sorry. I don't think we've heard your ladies names oh oh I'm Rebecca Moore I'm sorry I'm Rebecca Moore this is my mother Joanne Moore so sorry <laughs> well your mother referred to you as Rebecca she said okay. Rebecca will oh yes oh I yes. guess so very, nice. oh, very interesting how did they wash these things or how often did they wash them? you would only wash about once a week your dress if you were lucky if I mean you know that comes back to the old adage wash on Monday iron on Tuesday housework on Wednesday you know so you you if if you were lucky you had two dresses so you didn't have you know a lot of wardrobe and you basically wore the same dress they also didn't have closets back then for a lot of reasons we won't go into but you just took off your dress and you might hang it on a hook on a nail on the wall and when you got up that next morning you put it back on so I remember when my grandmother and my aunt would uh, wash their things in naphtha gas yes yes I, I grew up doing that so you mean cottons cottons yeah. uh, yes. well, go ahead was oh this is um, another thing that kind of became um, fashionable uh, as women didn't want to wear bonnets and they wanted you know to be more modern and younger and they started make they started wearing hats 
And so um, they had hats for gardening, specific hats for gardening. You'd have a specific hat if you went out visiting or calling. So this would be, this is a uh, reproduction off of a plate in Godies again of a calling hat that a young lady would wear when she went calling. And I made this hat at the time that I made this outfit. So it goes with that. Which is the front, which is the hat? This is, this is the front of the hat. Okay. And I kind of cheated with this one. I, and they had a very certain shape and the shape is very hard. A lot of them to find, a lot of them were, um, I want to say wicker, but that's a straw, a lot of straw hats. Um, they had straw bonnets too. Um, they, straw bonnets have to be made over a form and they had a lot of different types of straws that they would make their bonnets and their hats out of. Um, I have not been able to reproduce, you know, straw bonnets and hats. There are some people out there doing it, but it's, it's a very highly, you know, dedicated process to do it and you have to have the right equipment and I just have never gone there. Um, so this is, this is a hat, the shape of the hat I found at a, the base I found at a um, Goodwill store one time and I couldn't believe it. I was like, that's perfect. That's the perfect shape. Um, it's kind of a small bowler type hat. Um, and so I took off the trim and redid the trim, added the silk around, covered a buckle to match. And then this, this particular plate had a big feather coming over it. So this is what it looks like when you put it on. And you wear it down, you know, so it feathers over. So um, I or ordered the feathers from a costume house out west. Um, I want to wear it to so, church, but she won't let Yeah, me. I won't let her wear it to church. <laughs> um, and then I, uh, cur yeah, I had to curl the feathers. There's a way you curl the feathers. And um, then I tied the feathers on. It, there's a certain method you do when tying feathers on to a hat. And I learned how to do that, and I did that there. So um, anyway, that's, that's very nice. So that's, and the, so that's kind of an example of a you know, small hat, traveling hat that I can wear sometimes when we're going out doing something. So lovely. Just really thank wonderful. you. Thank you all so, for coming. Thank you very much. So, you're more than welcome to come up and look and